And welcome again, Third Church family. So excited for you to be here as we continue our study in parables. Today has us in Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to start right in at verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and says, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Verse 37 says, he answered, the one who sold the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. May God add a blessing to the reader here endure of his holy word. And as we go through what is before us today, I want to use for a subject this morning, weed is not our problem. Weed is not our problem. You know, when I was young, I would see some kids that thought their duty was to tell their parents on one another about everything that they were doing out of the way or mischievous. As we got older, this behavior migrated into classrooms where students calling attention to other students and even this behavior transfers into the workplace where someone always running to tell the boss about the shortcomings of another employee. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that behavior that will be detrimental should not be reported and it should. But this mindset brought into the church does not bode well for harmony in the body of Christ. It does not bode well for having compassion for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Some tend at time to think it's their duty to point out, make public, or even excommunicate people in the church. Listen, Jesus has told us that no matter where we go in this world, evil will be present. There will be those that are saved. There will be those that are unsaved. And as much as we want to be God's gardener and try to declare who's weed and, and pull them up, Jesus tells us today, weed is not our problem. It amazes me that so many think that they're doing something noble by making this statement and taking this stance. Well, there are just too many hypocrites in the church. That's why I don't go. And yet this is the only place where that excuse is used that makes the least sense. And you're right. There are hypocrites in the church. But guess what? There are also hypocrites at the Cardinals game. But if you get a ticket, you're going. There are hypocrites at your job, but you need that check. So you're going. And there are also hypocrites at the club. But lo and behold, the same person talking about hypocrites in the church is all up in the club kicking it on the regular, then what's the deal? What's going on? Based on what Jesus told us, we should not be surprised when there is not only evil present in the church, but there are people in the church at different places in their walk with God. There are some of our brothers and sisters who have stumbled in their walk. So it comes down to the fact that we need to realize for a stronger church, 
a more compassionate church, for a church of structure and order and love, we need to receive today that weed is not our problem. In this parable, Jesus says that as wheat and weeds grow side by side, they look a lot alike. And if we try to pull up the weeds, we would likely uproot the wheat as well. So we're told, let them grow together until the harvest. Then it will be easy to see which is which and then treat them accordingly. When the wheat and the weeds are in the beginning stages, it's almost impossible to tell them apart. And if we go around just pulling up weeds, we're going to destroy some of the wheat. So Jesus tells us, regardless of what you think your duty is, don't think that you're being more holy in my eye by trying to seek out and pull up weeds. We have no weed pulling experience. We can't tell the difference. And it's a direct order from Jesus saying that weed is not a problem. Jesus told this parable nearly 2000 years ago, but the lessons from it, the lessons that he's teaching are just as relevant today. As I said earlier, the presence of hypocrisy is everywhere, not just found in the church, but it's time to clear some things up. Even those of us who have been Christians for many years have experienced time when our guard was down, Satan shot his fiery darts and sin was the results. Now, there is a difference between a Christian struggling with sin and a hypocrite. There is a difference between a Christian struggling with sin and a hypocrite. A Christian struggling with sin comes to God saying, God, this is a weakness in my life. I really need the help of the Holy Spirit to deal with it. I can't do this alone. Help me send one of my brothers or sisters in Christ to hold me accountable because I need to get rid of this in my life. And God welcomes that prayer and promises to help. But the hypocrite doesn't really struggle to overcome their sin. They just try to hide it. They think when I go to church, I'll behave like a Christian and I'll say prayers and I'll sing songs. I will obey the rules. But when it comes out in the world, I'll just act differently and behave exactly the way those are behaving around me. You see, the word hypocrite originally comes from a Greek word, hypocrites. This means one who is play acting or wearing a mask, in acting or the Screen Actors Guild symbol, you see two masks where one is smiling and one is frowning. That's why the hypocrite is often called two-faced, someone who is trying to deceive, pretending to be different than he or she really is. I'm reminded of a story as I wrote this sermon there was a couple in a small town who was always very boastful about their life. And one day they had the whole town buzzing about their trip to Broadway in New York to see one of the hottest plays out. And everyone was so impressed because no one from this small town had ever been to a big city, let alone to see a play on Broadway. So the day came and they arrived in New York. They took a cab to the theater and to their disappointment, the play was completely sold out for the night and they could only afford one night in town. And they thought to themselves, well, what are we gonna do now? Everybody knows that we came all this way to see this play. We cannot dare tell them that we didn't see it. So what'd they do? They found a couple of ticket stubs on the sidewalk and they picked them up. They bought a program that described the various acts of the play. They went home singing songs they knew from the play to be famous. And they told everyone about this experience that they had going to see the play. They had ticket stubs, they had programs, they had been to the theater, they knew the music, but the problem was they never actually saw the show. And I was reminded about this because that's how it is sometimes with people in the church. They have a bulletin. They know the songs. They know what to say and what to do. But the problem is they never actually saw Jesus as Savior. They never actually saw Jesus as Lord of their lives. So they continue to play act. 
being one way in the church and something completely different outside of the church. Let me say that this is an exhausting lifestyle, living a two-faced life, pretending to be what you're not, acting one way around Christians and just the opposite around others, to have to pretend constantly that you're something that you aren't. It just drains you, drains you of all of your energy. That's why many social events are so exhausting for some people. You go to a party, you, you try to pretend that you're having a good time and that you like everybody when in actuality, you can't stand most of them and you'd rather be home or anywhere but where you are, completely exhausted trying to keep up the act. And that's why for some, coming to church is an exhausting experience. If you're play acting, you'll leave exhausted and wore out because you spent almost two hours of your life pretending to be something that you aren't. On the outside, we may consider this type of person a weed. And by all accounts, we may be right because we have seen them in action in their natural habitat outside the church. And we may be inclined to uproot them and cast them away. But we discover this behavior is against what Jesus says. Weed is not our problem. As Christian, it is not our responsibility to judge and or uproot hypocrites. Did you hear that? As Christians, it is not our responsibility to judge and uproot hypocrites. In this parable, when the servants saw the weeds, they came and asked, do you want us to go pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters first, Collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned, and gather the wheat to be brought into my barn. In other words, Jesus is saying, our job is not to judge hypocrites. Jesus never commissioned us to do that. So let us not come to the church and start uprooting anyone. However, there are things that we are called to judge. First of all, the Bible clearly teaches that we are to recognize and judge false teachings. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, it says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but are in ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. How do we do that? By learning the word and living the word, having such a relationship with God that if someone comes to you, with a God told me to tell you kind of thing, or Jesus is not the only way to heaven kind of thing, or other false teaching, we will know it to be false. Take a close friend or relative, and someone comes to you with something they, they said or, or did, and you will base the credibility of what was said based on your relationship with the person. And almost immediately, you will be able to tell if it's true or not. And this is how our relationship should be with God. And we should know. See, listen, even a dog barks when their master is attacked. I, I would be a coward if I saw God's truth attacked and yet remain silent. Jesus says that false teachers may look like sheep, sound like sheep, act like sheep, but they are not sheep. So how do we recognize them? Jesus says, by the fruit, you will recognize them. If they're sowing seeds of discord and bitterness among the saints, if they're causing people to become disobedient, then they are false teachers. So we are to judge false teachings. We're also to judge sinful actions. If someone in the church is doing sinful things and it is common knowledge among the brethren, then the church needs to act. Paul uses an example in 1 Corinthians 5 of a, of a man who was sleeping with his father's wife. You remember that, that sermon. The church knew about it, so Paul condemned the church because it didn't take any action. Now, what should the church have done? Paul said you should have gone to him. Seek reconciliation that would cause him to repent of his sin and change his ways. And if the man refused to repent, they should expel him from among them in hopes that he would come to his senses and repent. 
But if someone who isn't a Christian comes to the church seeking Christ, they can come regardless of their past, regardless of their sin. That's what the church is for. No matter what your past has been, if you are genuinely seeking a relationship with the Lord, you are welcome here. But once you become a Christian, once you've been forgiven, that changes the standard. Then if you slip back into sin, reconciliation and repentance need to take place. But even in this instance, it is not our responsibility to pull weeds. Weed is not our problem. That means that we're not to judge a person's salvation. That's not our job. God never put us on the judgment throne to say to a person, well, well you're lost, uh, but, but you're saved. You see, if, if you've not built a heaven for me, then I don't have a hell for you to send me to either. Huh? My responsibility as a Christian is to do my best to present the truth that is in God's word, both by what I say and but by what I do. And to leave the rest in God's hand, leave the weed pulling to the angels of God. God is true to his word. And when we try to take those matters into our own hands, we're saying that we don't believe that God will do it. We don't believe that God can handle it. We just don't believe God. And furthermore. We're not to judge another person's motives. We don't know what the circumstances and why they do what they do or they did what they did. We don't know their background, their emotions, what's going on the inside of them. But God does know. So leave that in God's hands. And hey, we didn't all come to the faith without needing some cleaning up in our lives. And Jesus is still coming to some of us with a dustpan and cleaning up some of our messes. Amen. God used what I was struggling with in order that I may be saved. Did you hear that? God used what I was struggling with in order that I may be saved. Now, what if the church in my struggle had put me out? What if it deemed me a weed and uprooted me? I mean, we don't know what God is doing. And, and someone who appears to be a weed, God may be doing something transformative in their life. But what God calls us to do is show this person love, show them compassion, show that we not only have a just God, but we serve a God that is, is no one is beyond saving. That doesn't matter what you've done or what you're doing now. The blood of Jesus can cover you and set you free from this sin bondage. So I'm not looking to uproot you but to share with you the true gospel and that you can be grafted into the tree called the body of Christ, that you will have a spirit in you that will bear witness with your spirit that you are now a child of God. When we realize that weed is not our problem, we can then bear more fruit through evangelism. When we start living, learning, we can start teaching by doing, and there won't be a need for a whole lot of talking. Of course, there will always be those who mock and demean the Christian lifestyle. But Matthew 13, verse 43 says, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. We get antsy at times because we think someone is going to get away with something. But listen to the words of the Apostle Paul when he said in Philippians chapter 2, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, the name that every knee should bow in heaven and in earth and under the earth. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. And I'm told that one of the things that wheat farmers learn early on is that when harvest comes, the real wheat is so heavy with the fruit of grain that the whole plant begins to bow. What a picture of an entire wheat field bearing fruit and bowing before the sun. If I'm bowing, I don't have time to be trying to worry about weeds. If I'm bowing and bearing fruit, I don't have the to be standing in ju judgment of others. Bowing, bearing fruit before the S-O-N. I will be moved to say, let me help you, not hurt you.
I'm going to be moved with compassion to say, let me pray for you, not gossip about you. Let me walk with you instead of cutting you down. Let me stand in the gap for you instead of throwing you into the flames because I was where you are right now, dead in my sin and sinking deeper by the day. But someone prayed for me. Someone took time to live the gospel before me. And when God threw me the life preserver called Jesus Christ, I grabbed it and I've never let go of it. Because if God has not saved us from something, then we really didn't need saving in the first place, right? So others need to see that the fruit of our wheat bearing and, and has us bowing before the Son of God called Jesus. Not just with works of righteousness, but I'm bowing because I'm bearing the fruit of the testimony that yes, I, I used to do drugs. I was a fornicator. I stole, I lied, I cheated. I blamed God. I had kids out of wedlock. I hurt people, deceived people. I, I made deals with God that I broke. Yes, I was angry and cursed God when my family member died. Yes, I let unsaved people keep me away from God. I had idol gods in my life. I was blinded by earthly treasures. I thought if I had enough money, I could solve all my problems, but that it's not my entire story because Jesus saved me. Jesus delivered me. Jesus resurrected me. My dead soul and breathed life into me. Now I live for Jesus, not shackled by my past, but redeemed in my present and glory to the Father that awaits my future in heaven. Weed is not my problem, but letting my light shine, showing love and compassion is the answer called my life right now. And I want you to taste and see for yourself that the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures for all generations. Bless you today. And I pray that you have been blessed by this sermon as I have. And I pray that you're also planning to be with us next week, where we will look at the parables of the workers in the vineyard in a sermon titled, God is Hiring. God bless you this week and God keep you this week.